Okay, so we are back. Um, it's been a while since we've had a chance to um, take a look at something that the church has produced and look at it through the filter of the different techniques and manipulations that are used to commonly control uh, groups of people in these unethical groups. Some people call them cults. Other people call them high demand groups. Uh, we're going to try to stay away from some of that inflammatory language and just say these are, you know, controlling groups or um, or the groups that use methods of undue influence. And as usual, we have author Luna Lindsay with us to uh, take a look at another topic. How are you doing today, Luna? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing good. It's great to be back in the saddle and doing this yeah. again. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I contacted you shortly after I saw a, a video that came out and suggested that we look at it because I think this is uh, just a brilliant example of how how really slick and really uh, just um, subtle and effective the messaging that the church uses. And that is Dieter Uchtdorf's talk on discovering truth. Um, and so that is going to be our target uh, for today. Um, I, I, I'm interested in just kind of getting um, your first impression of the video when you saw it. Uh, kind of like, what did you think? Um, I was pretty upset about this one. Uh, this is a, a story that he, he bases uh, his remarks on a story that I had heard right after leaving the church that meant a lot to me. And I feel like he, uh, and it's, it's also a story from uh, Eastern philosophy, Eastern religions, India. Uh, and I feel like he completely co-opted this for the church's own ends and um, distorted the, the, the meaning of this uh, that, that was that's culturally meaningful to a lot of people, uh, whether, whether you're American and white or you're from India and Hindu or one of the other religions that uses this story. Uh, so um, without spoiling the story and why I love it so much and what it means, and we'll get into that, I guess, as we go on, um, I just really uh, uh, was, was upset that he turned this around to be something that was um, more focused and closed-minded and narrow in viewing rather than the more broad, expansive, mind-opening story that I, the meaning that I took from the story when I first heard it, so. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, it's interesting for me to hear you say that you, you found a meaning in it that actually helped you in your transition. Um, because I, I think I've vaguely heard of this story before and, but I hadn't really thought of it in terms of uh, faith transition or anything like that. Um, because it's usually used as a way, as you said, to broaden your mind and to give you, um, you know, better tools to deal with the world around you. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of the brilliance of the way that the church and, and Dieter Uchtdorf presents it is that it has all of the trappings of logic and, mm -hmm. um, you know, openness, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's massaged in a way that uses fear and uncertainty and doubt yeah. to get you to actually close your mind down. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. I think one of the themes that kept popping into my head that I want to make sure is kind of part of the backdrop when we go into this is, you know, imagine that, you know, you're, you're put in a prison cell and there's a box of tools right there in front of you, which includes all of the tools that you would need to disassemble the lock and, and free you from the prison cell. Mm -hmm. But your captor tells you those tools are no good. You shouldn't use them. Mm -hmm. don't, don't even try to use them. You know, some of the tools may work. Some of them may not work. We can never know. So just don't even try to use them. Yeah. And so you're stuck in the prison and you can, I mean, what they've done is they've basically cut off your legs. They've, they've taken the exact tools that you would need to liberate yourself mm -hmm. and they've completely poisoned them in your mind so that yeah. you, you can't free yourself yeah. from the prison. And it's, so I think a, it's like saying there's a scorpion in that box. You know, yeah. you reach your hand in that box, there's a scorpion. So you, and there isn't, there isn't a scorpion in the box. No, but, th but that's the thing that actually gives you. And, and, you know, if they say there's a scorpion in a box, then you're almost grateful. Oh, thank you for sent for saving me mm -hmm. from that danger. I might've actually put my hand in that box. Whereas, you know, without that phobia, without the fear that they taint, you know, that tool with, it would be a very liberating thing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So let's get started. 
Um, this is from a general conference from a few years ago. It's actually after we started doing the undue influence in general conference talks. Um, I think I remember when we first heard this one thinking, you know, that would be a really good one to go to, but life got away with, I think, both of us and it was hard to catch up. So I'm kind of glad that they came out with this video because it reminded us, hey, we need to go back and really dig into this story uh, to unpack it and help us kind of diffuse the controlling nature of it. So okay. let me get things set up here. And as we always do, we'll just start listening and then pause when there's something to, to comment on. So hopefully the sound will work and let's start. Well, over 100 years ago, an American poet put to rhyme an ancient parable. The first verse of the poem speaks about six men of Indostan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. In the poem, each of the six travelers takes hold of a different part of the elephant and then describes to the others what he has discovered. One of the men finds the elephant's leg and describes it as being round and rough like a tree. Another feels the tusk and describes the elephant as a spear. A third grabs the tail and insists that an elephant is like a rope. A fourth discovers the trunk and insists that the elephant is like a large snake. Each is describing truth. And because his truth comes from personal experience, each insists that he knows what he knows. The poem concludes, and so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. Great animation. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a great story, and uh, I am so with Uchtdorf so far. I'm with him. Great story. Okay, so... <laughs> There's a couple of themes that they've already covered, which are very critical. And, and so I think the, the one that stands out the most is that he's talking about our search for truth. Mm -hmm. And that, that concept, the search for truth, is one of the, the key essential, I don't know if it's a bugaboo or if it's a focus of energy that you'll see in any of these controlling groups, because... Mm -hmm. The controlling groups all have that as something that everybody desires. They want that truth. And so it doesn't matter whether you're in Jehovah's Witnesses, in Scientology, in the Moonies, in Jonestown, or whatever. All of these people are there and they're attracted to it because they believe that the truth is there. And that ties into a number of other concepts. Um, elitism, uh, sacred science. All of these different things are focused down on this idea that they possess the truth. Right. And, and that, I think, that idea that everyone's seeking the truth is, isn't actually true. Um, not everybody is seeking the truth. Not everyone needs firm answers. Some people are, are seekers, but they're, they don't, not all who are wanderers are lost, as Tolkien put it. Um, some, some, uh, me, for instance, I'm, I find a lot of um, fulfillment in knowing that the questions are out there. And if someone comes to me and says, I have the absolute answer to these questions, uh, that's going to send me running because I know that these are the kind of questions that can't have firm answers. So, Well, I, I see your perspective on that, but mm -hmm. the way that I would look at that is that your, your ability to deal with uncertainty and your acceptance of the fact that for some things there is no absolute truth is a form of truth in and of itself. And it's that concept which informs your decision to be skeptical of some people that claim to be handling, handing you truth. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that all of us conduct our lives is we have this concept of what is real and we make choices based on our concept of what is real. Mm -hmm. And the way that Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses, the way that they get their people to follow them is they distort the, what those people perceive as real is so suddenly, if your child's dying for need or want of a blood transfusion, what is real to you 
is that you will displease Jehovah and jeopardize your eternal well-being if you allow your son to have that blood transfusion. And so truth, what is real, all of that is tied together in how people conduct their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think your point is very good. That's that once you let, once, for example, a Jehovah's Witness or a Scientologist escapes that trap of, of pseudo truth that they have, then the fact that those things are no longer true is part of their new reality. Uh -huh. And I think if, if you're like me, then you realize that you've been victim of that type of deception before. And so your new reality is what I would consider to be a healthy, protective skepticism of anyone else that's trying to control you by holding on to truth and making you pass through certain hoops in order to get that truth. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I think what I appreciated so much about this story after I left Mormonism is that it, it basically, to me, said nobody knows all the truth. There's no way to know all the truth. The truth, whatever that, whatever we're talking about, whether it's God or how the universe operates, whatever that is, that we're all just men in the dark feeling our way around this thing that we no one can understand. We do, we are not equipped with the correct senses and testing equipment and knowledge at the, you know at this date into 2018 to know what that is. And for me, it was a refutation of prophets and seers and revelators of anyone from any religion that comes and says, I know that God is a rope. I know that an mm. elephant is a rope. Um, to me, I could say, well, you think the elephant is a rope and those guys over there think it's a fan and I'm going to accept that I don't know what the elephant is. And so for me, it was very freeing. Um, if Victor ended the story here, I think that that's what a lot of people would walk away with. Yes. And I think you pointed out one of the brilliant manipulative aspects of how the story is used. And that is when we first encounter the story, we see, you know, it depends on who you're putting in the position of all these different people that are blind and feeling for the truth. Because, you know, we, I think our natural tendency is to put ourselves in that position. And that is what Dieter Uchtdorf is telling us to do, is to mm -hmm. put ourselves in the position of these blind people. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, the fact that each of those people grab onto a different part of the trunk and then immediately start telling everybody else what reality is, what truth is, Mm -hmm. The correct people to put in the place of those blind men are the prophets, seers, and revelators, the ones who are imposing their concept of truth on everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this parable with them in that seat, then it totally changes it. And I think that's a much more realistic way of looking at things. Definitely. Because um, you, even within the 12 today, you can't get agreement on, a, you know, what exactly church doctrine is regarding homosexuality. You can't get agreement on a number of fine things. You know, I've, I've been looking at talks by David Bednar and some of the other apostles, and you'll find one of them say that, you know, faith is one thing and definitely not another. And somebody else will say, well, faith is something else. I think even, you know, our new prophet, uh, Russell M. Nelson, he's got an infamous article that says God's love is not you know, is, you can describe it as a number of things, but it is not unconditional. And then you've got another apostle who says, well, God's love is unconditional. And so you know, each of them have already grasped onto this truth elephant of the gospel, and they're in and of themselves coming up with different answers. Yeah. But yeah. that's not how they're using this parable. Yeah, as we're about to see. <laughs> yes. Um, I think it's interesting that... Um, if, if you do what I believe this parable is meant to do and, and give us a humble perspective towards how we perceive the world around us, it actually is sort of a morality tale in that each of us needs to be aware of our own limitations mm -hmm. and use that to temper how we interact with other people and understand that things may be bigger than we perceive and thereby open our mind to seeing new perspectives and maybe yeah. changing our, our views. Definitely. And but I think it's oh, go ahead. Finish your point. Well, okay. since they <laughs> seem to have carved out an exception where they as prophets, seers and revelators don't have to put themselves in that position. Yeah. Then it just cements the fact that they don't do that. They are not open to other perspectives that, you know, when you listen to Bednar or Oaks talk, they speak as though it is unfathomable that anyone could raise their hand and say, uh, actually, you know, you're full of crap. Right. 
yeah, I felt the elephant and I felt a fan, not, uh, not I didn't feel the atonement when I felt the elephant. Uh, I felt enlightenment instead. And I think that that's another part of why this story really rankles me because as an anti-racist, um, I, I see this as co-opting a culture with very incredibly different beliefs than Mormonism. Um, whether it's, uh, I, I looked this up on Wikipedia, this story has origins going back um, at least 2000 years and it was a parable before that, at least another 2000 years. So this is a, this is a, a story that's many thousands of years old. Uh, sorry, it was a pr proverb before that. Um, and if it, it comes out of um, Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sufism, and I've done a little bit of research um, in, into those different belief systems, and they're incredibly different from Mormonism. And to say, uh, again, I'm going to end up spoiling where he's going to go with this, but to say nobody knows, to use someone else's story, a, a Hindu story, to say nobody knows what truth is by because everyone's blind, but we do know what truth is. We're, we know the truth, and it's this Mormon truth. To me, feels just really disingenuous because they're using it to erase all of these stories of, of, of philosophies of people that are, that have a lot of wisdom to share. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I, I read Buddhism. I listen to Buddhist speakers and there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, there's a lot of truth about compassion and how to treat our fellow man and our fellow creatures, um, not just human beings. And uh, I think that that's another reason the story really bothers me because it closes off the minds of Mormons who could learn so much um, from other faiths that are very different from theirs. So no. it's almost like they took a story which was meant to allow other people escape deception mm -hmm. and escape manipulation, and they repackaged it, distorted it, and used it to close off the minds of yeah. people who may have doubts and questions in Mormonism. And yeah. that type, I mean, it's 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 almost as offensive as like you know baptizing Holocaust survivors in that it takes something that was developed, matured, and used for a certain purpose in a completely different culture and tradition and, you know, put a white shirt on it and morphed it into this Mormon thing. Yeah. To me, right. the story says Let's you keep... should listen. You should listen to, you should learn from other people and their background, their belief, their personal experiences. That's what it says to me. So, yeah. yeah. All right. And, and I think you'll see at the end, he ties it back to that sort of message, but it's completely discordant with what he centrally conveys in it. So we'll see. We'll get to that. All right. All right. That Keep someone going. could make a judgment based on one aspect of truth and apply it to the whole seems absurd or even unbelievable. On the other hand, have we ever been guilty of the same pattern of thought? We have so many examples of things that mankind once knew were true, but have since proven false. Okay. Uh, we got to stop right here. Hold on yeah. a second. I got to I got Nothing gotta... about okay. that elephant. There we go. Okay. Nothing so, about the elephant was untrue, by the way. There's nothing in the story that says the, the elephant isn't a snake. It's, it's, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's my thing about that. How does he go from everything is true, which is what the story is saying to there's all this stuff that we don't know is true. Anyway, I'll let <laughs> no, I mean, I think this is, this is the pivot. This is where they take a good concept and then they distort it for their own ends. Uh -huh. And this, the way that we've gone now into the modern realm reveals exactly what they're trying to do. Okay. So you know, he said, have we ever been in that situation where we've only, we have a limited view and we're taking just this small point and then we're making assumptions about the whole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can pussyfoot around it, but what we're talking about are people that are seeing problems in church history, in conflicting doctrine. And they're saying, wait a second, if this doesn't make sense at this level, then it has something to do with the entire church as a whole. And so if let's let's step out of Mormonism now, pretend that you're a Scientologist and you found something in L. Ron Hubbard's history or his background or conflicting teachings. And you say, wait a second, if he has this so terribly wrong, then it means that everything else that he told us was the absolute truth that built up the entire structure of Scientology is inherently flawed and untrustworthy. And I'm going to get out so that I can live my life without having to restrain myself to the delusions and deceptions of L. Ron Hubbard. And so 
yeah, I'm going to make some key generalizations based on smaller confined conclusions right. because they have heavy, weighty, and far-reaching implications. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, the graphic that they use here is so telling because let's take a look at this. Okay, I want you to pay attention to the different things that are actually pointed out here. Now, this is the one that really caught my eye because what they're telling us is that, you know, you know, there are things that we may know now, but science in the future is going to tell us even more truth about it. And so you've got this little bubble here with the gender arrows. And make no mistake about it, what they're telling you is that, you know, what these men have been teaching regarding gender and sex and LGBT issues is the truth. And if it doesn't make sense now, we just need to suppress our personal conscience and wait for future results to reveal that they were right all along. And not only that, but come and look over here at DNA. Why is DNA in this list of things that they're trying to poison our minds for so that we don't accept it? Well, could it be because the DNA research has actually demonstrated you know, definitively that the story and the narrative that Joseph Smith and all of the prophets up until this day have, have held, which is that the, the descendants of the peoples of the Book of Mormon are the, you know, Native Americans. And so we're already seeing just, you know, a few seconds into this transition, this pivot in the video, that they are laying the seeds for us to reject or be skeptical of the findings of science, modern concepts of ethics and morality, and hold on to what they have been feeding us for centuries. Right. And the, the fair look at this elephant would be to be skeptical or questioning of everything, uh, to give equal, you know, each of those blind men was equally right and wrong about the elephant. And it, this teaches us that we're to be skeptical of anything that doesn't come from the church leaders, which is mm -hmm. very different than the moral of this, this other story. Right. So. Because remember, the proper way to frame this story is that the people who are perceiving truth and then imposing it on everyone else are these blind men. Right. And that means that Uchtdorf and Holland and Nelson, all of them, they are the blind men. Mm -hmm. We're the people who are listening to the blind men, looking at the elephant and saying, what the flip are you talking about? Right. Because yeah. we, are, we are the ones who are capable of actually looking beyond the decrees of these men to consider other truths other than what they're handing us. Yeah. And even but if again, they're cutting... Go ahead. Even if even if we're also blind in this situation, um, being open to talking to other other fellow travelers who are just as as without senses as we are to say, when you felt the el elephant, what did you feel? I felt a tree, and I, that's interesting because I felt a rope. Um, mm -hmm. it, rather than looking to one authority who claims to be sighted, who claims to be able to see all of the elephant, um, my philosophy is. We need to we need to explore the rest of the elephant on our own. Yeah. So yeah. And, and I think you know, as I look at what he's doing with this video and what the church has been telling people in terms of what we would call milieu control, mm -hmm. you know, controlling which sources of information you trust, which conclusions you trust, what logical um, mechanisms you allow yourself to go through, you know, what the if we put ourselves in the place of these men, the reason that they're blind isn't because they have no sight. It's because they've been told to close their eyes and they've mm -hmm. kept their eyes closed. Whereas if each one of them would just open their eyes and then while they're feeling the tusk or the ear, look around and see the rest of it and integrate all of that information, then each of them would very easily come to a full conclusion. But because they've been artificially blinded, we're left with this dilemma. So. Uh, let's keep going. Thoughts. For example, in spite of a one-time overwhelming consensus, the Earth isn't flat. The stars don't revolve around the Earth. And of course, men actually can fly, even break the sound barrier. So it, it really offends me. <laughs> I'm sorry, David Bednar, I chose to be offended. I, but, um, you know, he's taking these great, marvelous innovations of technology 
that speak to our awareness of the universe around us, our control over the elements, our use of physics, engineering, and technology to be able to fly. All of these things, these achievements of mankind were done by challenging, mm -hmm. strongly held notions, looking at areas of inconsistency, exploring things that didn't make sense to gain new knowledge, to a new understanding that empowered mankind to achieve this level of sophistication in terms of understanding the world around us and flying and all of these things. And toppling authority. And uh, exactly. Asking, asking I questions. Mean, and, you know, Copernicus or who, yeah. you know, the, you know, just challenging the notion that the earth isn't the center of the universe. Yeah. Which he and addressed. Looking, looking towards scientific evidence for authority rather than looking towards uh, human voices, whether those were written in books, old books, or a living person um, who's claiming some kind of mantle of authority. All of these uh, were, all of these barriers that were broken or uh, pieces of understanding that we gained came from saying, what is the evidence? What can we actually measure and touch and see and feel? Uh, we don't, we don't get those from looking at old books. Hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, each one of those stages had to challenge some pre-existing notion. Yeah. And so those are examples of where doubt can take you. Those are examples of where dissent can take you. And to have it included as an aside in part of this video, to me, just proves that they are willing to co-opt anything to serve their purposes. And they're counting on the membership to take them at their word and not challenge any of the distortions that they impose upon people. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's keep going. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Often truth is rejected because it doesn't appear to be consistent with previous experiences. <laughs> The thing about truth is that it exists beyond belief. Okay, I want to go back to that frame right there. Let's see if we can do it. Okay. So what just happened in this video? So the little kid gave the elephant an apple and it created this sound that did that was not consistent with anything that all of these people were perceiving and they thought the truth was. Mm -hmm. And so some of the guys, like, they're perplexed. They have a question mark over their head. We'll just focus on this here. And then one of them has said, well, I'm going to create an explanation that makes sense of this new knowledge, but still hold on, holds on to my prior conception. And so he's got a snake holding a trumpet that would make that sound. Mm -hmm. and I think it's really fun. It's funny. I think it's funny. A chuckle. It is. It's cute. It's, it's really so, cute. I mean, this, and this animation just actually takes place in the background. He doesn't address it. This is a decision like the animators came up with to inject into this video. And I think it's, it's actually, it's good because it kind of shows what happens when you're challenged with new information, when you're trying to figure out what this thing is. Mm -hmm. And the thing that came to my mind when I saw this is, um, you know, I put myself in the position or members of the church in the position where we're all standing around this elephant feeling it. And I say, okay, let's say the elephant is Christianity as understood by Mormonism. And everybody's got their hands on it. They're part of the church. They, they think they understand what it means to be Christian. They've listened to talks where we hear about how the gift of the Holy Ghost is just the most important thing ever. Like we need it. You know, you get baptized, then you get the gift of the Holy Ghost and you got to have that to be your guide when you go uh, and, you know, it's going to help you make decisions. It's going to help you discern things. You got to have the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then suddenly the November 2015 policy comes out and children of gay parents who are married can't get baptized and they can't get the gift of the Holy Ghost. And apostles come out and they're like, you know, it's, we're doing this to protect the children. Don't worry about it. When they get 18, if they disavow their parents' marriage, they can get baptized. They can get the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's not a big deal. And for me, the, the disconnect between that is like this trumpet of the elephant where it suddenly blows and makes a sound and everyone's like, hold on, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, because or even just, 
even just the anti-gay policy in the first place that not allowing not allowing gay people to get married you have the family proclamation people are like why is it so hurtful well when i read the the family proclamation now thankfully i'm bi which means i can date guys so i could pretend and i could i could date a guy and marry a guy and follow the lds plan just fine but i can easily put myself in the shoes of many lesbians who or or gay men who are reading these this it goes on and on about families and the blessings of families and how there's nothing more important than a family and how wonderful it is to have a forever family it goes on and on and then promptly says but this is just for straight people this is all in the same family proclamation it says this is only between a man and a woman and then the church you're reading it backwards am i reading backwards it's it it kind (laughs) of goes on and on it's like one little sentence anyway uh no, I'll, I'll talk to you what I meant by that, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, so to me, it, it's a similar thing. It's like saying families are super important, but then when, when a gay person says, what about me? They say, well, just live celibate the rest of your life and God will work it out. That completely takes the air out of all of those promises and how special those promises are supposed to be. It is denying the blessings of families that you have just trumpeted about. Like with like the snake with the trumpet, you've just trumpeted about that. And now you've said, ah, but sorry, uh, you don't, you don't get to have this. Well, see, I can understand from your perspective why you would perceive it that way, Mm -hmm. because you already accept as a premise that a family in a gay relationship can have all of those benefits. Mm -hmm. But when I say you're reading it backwards, it's because you've accepted that premise that the church in no way accepts. Right. Because that is a counterfeit family that has only a false, temporary, fleeting, sick notion of happiness associated with it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and, and conventional chapel Mormons are going to read the proclamation on the family. They, they're already going to know with it's not even an issue that what you just described, uh, a gay couple enjoying a family life, that's, you know, that's not real happiness. That's not a real family. And so they're going to read that proclamation and they're going to say, yes, all these family things are important. And that's why we've got to make sure that the laws prevent gay people from getting married, because if they get married, then my family's going to go to heck and they're going to teach my children to be gay. And they're, everybody's going to be gay. And then the entire civilization of the earth is going to be wiped out in one generation. Like that's something that actually Elder Oaks said. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, that's not, you can't even go there, but I agree. You know, if you hold the notion that, there is as much validity, as much love, as much uh, community support in a gay marriage as there can be in a traditional heterosexual marriage, then the, you know, that proclamation on the family is like the tooting of this elephant. It's like, it's like, what are you talking about? But that's because the truth that you understood is the, the concept of a family being an inclusive thing. Right. I just think conventional it's, it's Mormons. When they tell, it's when they tell gay people that they can still be happy in the gospel by being celibate or by entering a mixed orientation marriage, that it's it's a similar thing of here is this great thing that's so awesome, but you can live without it because it's maybe not such yeah. a big deal in this conversation. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so let's keep going. Right. Beyond belief. <laughs> it is true even if nobody believes it. We simply don't know all things. Okay. What he just said is actually one of, one of, um, I I don't know. I I have mixed feelings about it. So he said, you know, the thing about truth is that it is true, even if nobody believes it. Now, how can that be both a good and a bad statement? Because how he's going to frame it, I, I, that's absolutely true. There are things are, if a tree falls in the forest, it does make a sound, even if no one is there to hear it. Um, but the question is, who is going to define that truth? Who is going to say? Now, Uchtdorf says a humbling thing there by saying that, uh, I forget the wording, but basically uh, we there's things that some people don't know. But what he's about to do is he's about to say that he knows. Yeah. And the church knows. Yeah. And I think the concept of there's some things that are true and it's true, even if nobody believes it. And that's, that's a defensive wall psychologically. It's basically allowing members to say, even if you're, even if your child rejects Joseph Smith as the prophet, rejects the gospel, even if everybody in your life rejects it, you still have the truth. It's not a popularity contest. We still have the truth. Even if the church, you know, 
becomes completely backwater and everybody leaves, we still have the truth because it is true regardless of whether no one believes it. And so and I see that. Coin. It's a two-sided mm -hmm. coin because uh, if the church isn't true, then it isn't true, even if all those people believe it. Exactly. That's, you know, that, but that's the conclusion they don't want you to go to. He doesn't talk about that. Okay. Uh, and the thing that gets me though, is that it's, it alludes to a pseudoscientific principle though. You know, when we engage in the process of scientific discovery, there are plenty of things that are true that we don't believe now just because we haven't done the experiments, we haven't done the research, we haven't been exposed to the data that would establish those things as true. And so I think, you know, that that's like the perpetual pursuit of science is to identify those things that are true that can be established by going through that process. Mm -hmm. But this is where we have this, um, this sort of pseudoscientific, pseudological um, uh, mental workings that are a part of how the deception and the manipulation works in these groups. Mm -hmm. And if you explore the concept of sacred science, a part of sacred science is that they've got all these theological, metaphysical things that interact together in a pseudo quasi logical way so that you can actually apply your rational mind to it and see it as something that is consistent with logic as long as you don't allow your mind to consider alternate possibilities or other variables. Yeah, and it, it concerns um, itself primarily with things that there is no evidence for either way. So there, there isn't an actual elephant that we can feel and touch and see in this case. Science concerns itself with things that are non-falsifiable, empirical evidence. And the beauty about those things is they're objective. If I hold up this pencil, um, I, you can see it. I can see it. I, I could send it to you. You could test it. You could see that it's made out of wood um, and graphite and plastic. And you can, uh, you can investigate that. And everyone who investigates that pencil will have similar or identical results. The trouble with church claims is that most of them are about things that cannot either be proven or disproven. If I claim that this pencil is made out of ice cream, you can test it and say it's it's not made out of ice cream. Um, but the church claims, none of us can test it. I mean, we can pray, but that's emotional. So that's, and it's subjective. I, I'm the only one that will, will feel the feelings that I feel if I, if I say a prayer and get it answered. Um, we can live our life a certain way and try to decide whether we're happy or not. Um, but that's also subjective. I'm, I can say I'm happy when I'm not, um, only I know whether I'm happy or not. And I think that that's one of the really big differences between scientific claims and church claims. Mm, but the way that they, the way they capture that though, is, is you could be happy mm -hmm. and you can think you're happy. And they're going to come along and tell you, oh, not. so you think you're happy? You're not really happy. Kind the of. only true and lasting happiness is by following our rules and submitting to our leadership. That's the only true and lasting happiness. And so it, it limits what people feel comfortable or what they'll allow themselves to experience or do because they're put under that kind of spell. Exactly. And and that's something, again, that they they deal with subjective claims like that because it is so easy to say you don't know what you're talking about because we can't test it empirically like we can test physical objects yeah and i think part of the brilliance of how they're using this video is you've talked about kind of metaphysical things that you can't test okay so things like you know what are the requirements for salvation soteriology like you know those are things that religious authorities impose upon people, you need to do this, this, and this, and this, and you'll be in good standing with God, and you'll get all of these wonderful blessings, and you'll be in paradise if you're Jehovah's Witness, or, or you'll get clear if you're Scientology, or you'll get Celestial Kingdom if you're in, the, in Mormonism. And those things can't be tested, mm -hmm. but even though they're intangibles, you have to change and alter the very tangible, real, objective things of your life in order to conform and, and reach those things. And so the, the way that those intangibles cross over into the very practical aspects of your life is very problematic if they don't allow you to critically examine mm -hmm. the basis upon which they are entitled to make those claims about things that are not provable. Exactly. And an extension of that type of manipulation is also where 
we all acknowledge you can't prove these soteriology things and, and they'll say you just you know we'll, we'll find out after, in the eternities and so we don't apply or we can't trust logical inconsistencies to establish those things we have to go on faith but what they're doing now is they're taking that process of not critically examining these things because they're intangible and we have to take them on faith and we're saying you have to use that same mental process for any objective thing that might have implications on the authority of the church. Like and so the if you Mormon look historical records, right, if you look at Smith. anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, things that Joseph Smith did in terms of, you know, polyandry, um, you know, lying to the church membership and the people, if you look at all those problematic things in history, they're saying, well, you know, we don't know everything. Who knows what truth is? Nobody really knows. In the future, we're going to learn some other information that'll make it all make sense. Mm -hmm. And so just suspend your logic, suspend your mind, suspend your thinking, keep praying, paying, and obeying, and it'll all work out in the end. Yeah. And, and the linchpin here, the linchpin here is if if there is a God, God knows all this. He know He gave us a rational mind. He gave us uh, critical thinking skills. He, he that is our one as human beings. That is the one survival trait that we have. You put a, a naked man in the woods uh, out in the middle of nowhere, he's not going to survive more than like a couple of days because our only, um, our only survival trait is our ability to socialize with others and our cleverness, our ability to think about the world and make tools. God knows that about us if there is a God. And so to me, this idea that God created this narrow, straight and narrow path that we have to follow and we can only base it on faith because it deals with subjective issues and not objective issues. And we're supposed to deny any objective issues that do come up. To me, that is a, a, a being who is abusive, inherently authoritarian, and not the kind of person that I think we ought to be following. Uh, to me, that doesn't really seem like a God, though, definitely not a benevolent God. To me, that seems like uh, human beings, controlling and manipulative human beings. Yeah. And when you get, when you look and you see that all of these descriptions of God's requirements that would confine people to those, to that narrow box come from men, mm -hmm. not from a direct communication between God and you. And, and, and they'll say, well, wait, wait, hold on. You know, we told you this, but you asked God yourself and he confirmed it. Well, that is just a type of manipulation that binds people to the group because they're told, oh, if you feel a certain way, then it means that what I've told you is the truth because they've co-opted part of normal human physiology where when you, um, you know, when you listen to, hear something or study and read something that you've already been primed to have it be important to you in your mind, you get this frisson sensation, you get this feeling that you're told is the spirit when we know it's easily manipulatable and predictably manipulatable because when we go to movies, when we watch television commercials that try to move you uh, with music, with themes about family and love and God, you know, they're very easy to do that. And, you know, it's a whole commercial trade making these type of emotionally moving commercials. But when they give you the lie that when you feel that it means that what I've told you is true, it just completely distorts everything so that you have now taken yourself in on the con. And if you're going to if you're going to reject David Bednar or Russell M. Nelson, first you have to reject your own experience that they told you you had to have to confirm that what they said was true. You have to say, well, wait a second. Even though I have those experiences and I perceive them as true, I need to understand that those are not reliable indications of truth because it's only when I realize that then I can reject these other people. I have to reject my own past experiences. Yeah. And that's very hard for people to do. You don't want to admit that you're wrong or that you've been deceived. And back to the elephant, other people from other religions have those same emotional confirmations, those same mm -hmm. spiritual confirmations. You read, go read, I challenge anyone, go read a testimony by a member of an FLDS uh, sect, one of the FLDS groups. Uh, they sound just like Mormon testimonies, but then when they start talking about their husbands or other aspects that are a little bit different from Mormonism, and it, it's really surreal to read those. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. We can't see everything. Because we see through a glass darkly, we have to trust the Lord who sees all things clearly. Okay, so there's, there's, okay. Number one, 
we can't see everything. So he's planted the seed of uncertainty and doubt about your own faculties, about your own senses. So if you're listening to Brother Uchtdorf, then you've immediately suppressed your own concept of the world around you because you're now starting to distrust your senses. You're saying, well, even if I see something, even if it would naturally lead to a conclusion, if that conclusion conflicts with what these brethren are telling me, I have to reject it because I can't see anything. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the first deception I see there. Next, but he says, the we brethren? see... They can't. Well, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They, but that, they're he, just he as limited as we are. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're not supposed to see that part, though. Next, he <laughs> says, and, and you'll see the way they do that is they don't talk about themselves. They talk about God and the unstated truth for Mormons is that the way you know what God tells you what to do is by the brethren, but they don't say that. That's just this unstated premise. So, but, okay, so after that, he's done this, you know, we, we don't see everything. So distrust your senses, distrust your logical reasoning and faculties. Then he says, we see through a glass darkly. And what he's doing there is he's making a biblical illusion. Yep. He's tying in now century old tradition of biblical Christianity because there's this threat of if you're not going to believe the Book of Mormon, then you can't believe the Bible. And it's turned on itself where since, you know, you have to accept the Bible, if we make references to the Bible, it, it seals in our own truth and you have to believe us. And so the it, it, I think that makes it very easy for people to accept, oh, he's making a reference to the Bible, okay? And if the Apostle Paul said it, then it must be true because you know, Christians all over the world, except the Apostle Paul. So that's even more truer. And um, so we see through a glass darkly. And the thing is, that concept of we see through a glass darkly is used a number of ways. And it can be used in an intellectually humble way, just like this parable, where it allows people to open their mind to other possibilities. But it can also be used to close people's minds off because what it's imposed upon people, it says that you know, you as a person see through a glass darkly. So if you don't understand why we as the religious group are making you do certain things, you just need to realize your understanding is limited because we see through a glass darkly and go along. Yeah. You know, so and again, you can imagine people that the leaders see better than we do. Right. And, exactly. Uh, and the leaders where, have this special calling. Yeah. And that's where when you dig deeper, you find statements from general authorities and such that indicate that they're they're just like the revelations that they receive, they receive them the exact same way as anyone who's reading Ramon, uh, reading Mor Moroni 10.4 and you, they're praying and getting feelings just like the rest of the numbers. That's all they're doing. They are, they are groping around with a blindfold on, feeling that elephant just like the rest of the membership. But that's not how they present it. Um, that's yeah. not how well, they, want, they want members to think. Yeah, and, and I think this speaks to doublethink and, mm -hmm. you know, where you have two conflicting ideas that we're supposed to accept simultaneously. There's a recent um, secret recording or, you know, Bednar came to Houston and he talked to the people there and there's a recording. And at the beginning of his talk, he says, you know, some people think that we as the brethren, you know, live in a totally different world that we, you know, we're just like you guys. Right. And I think this speaks to what, when they say that, you know, I have just as much access to the mind of God as any other member. I get revelation the same way. I pray. It's a still small voice. And, and so we, we instantly relate to them. And, and so at that part of the talk, people could relate to him. But then like just 30 minutes later in the same talk, he's saying, you have no idea what it's like to be one of the brethren. We live in a completely different world. Like he literally says this, we live in a completely different world because we're off doing lessons this day and that day. We're traveling all over the world. We're constantly receiving revelation. You know, you may get bored by giving the same talk a hundred times, but anytime we deviate from the talk, that's revelation. And so that double think where we're supposed to see them as ourselves, but then we're also supposed to accept things that they claim as revelation mm -hmm. as authoritative because they have a special calling, a special ability to perceive and convey the will of God. That yeah. Those are inconsistent notions, but they the members, and I remember when I was in the same position, we accept it. And you don't even question it. You don't challenge it. Mm -hmm. And that's what this video helps.
people to do is yeah. we see through a glass darkly. We don't yeah, understand everything. So we have to depend on the authorities. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The third thing in that little segment, he said, we see through a glass darkly because we don't know everything, but God knows all things. And the hidden assumption in that, the hidden truth for Mormons in that is that the way that God tells you all things is through the brethren. So the things that the brethren tell you are God's truth informed by reality everywhere, conveyed through the brethren. And so even if you have a difference of opinion, a difference of conscience, you still need to obey the brethren because they are conveying God's omniscient will to the world. Yeah. He did all that yeah. in like five seconds with like three yeah. phrases. All of the, all of that manipulative information was just in those past three seconds. I want to listen to it again because, kind of you know, brilliant. when you hear his accent and the confidence in which he speaks, you know, you just, uh -huh. you the just calmness, love him. The gentleness. Right. And it's, yeah. it's, I mean, you got to listen to him because he's just so compelling. Because we see through a glass darkly, we have to trust the Lord who sees all things clearly. That is because there's one source of truth that is complete, correct, and incorruptible. That source is our infinitely wise and all-knowing Heavenly Father. He knows truth as it was, as it is, and as it yet will be. Our loving Heavenly All right, all right, all right, all right. There's so much wrong with what he did. So, okay, so there's one source of incorruptible truth. Okay, well, let's list some of the ways that the brethren who claim to convey this one source of incorruptible truth have been wrong. And not just like, oh, I got a little thing wrong, but like dead wrong. You know, you have the, Bring first of all, the, Quakers. the exactly, Brigham Young, he, I think he like tossed most of the wrong things out there, but <laughs> Joseph Smith had his own uh, you yeah. know, bucket of wrong. Yeah. You know, so we have just the, the biggest elephant in the room, so to speak, is <laughs> for me, racism. You know, the fact that we could go through 150 years of blatant, false, bigoted, backwater teachings about black people being cursed, being descendants of Cain, um, having pre-mortal, less valiant choices. They were not as righteous in the pre-mortal existence, so they deserved not only the color of their skin, but they deserved a lesser standing in society. That people born in nations like Africa that were less to do materially, that was their punishment for the choices they made in the pre-mortal existence, and it empowered people who were white and blessed to look down on those people. You know, all of those ideas were not only brought forth by these brethren, they were given the power of godly sanction because these brethren held the notion that they could convey God's truth. And then whenever little, you know, specks of real humanity challenged them, like Lowry Nelson or Stuart Udall, they, they tried to snuff those lights out and they reinforced their dark, false ideas and so this is where you see that, you know, he's setting up godly authority as a place where we can feel comfortable that truth comes from. When if you look at the history, the fact is that not only do these men not have the truth, they're just like you and I, they're subject to the biases and prejudices of their culture, but there is real danger in giving them the power of this godly sanction, because then it makes it harder for you to change course. It makes it harder for you to see where you were wrong because then you're afraid that people are going to figure out that you don't have a real divine connection. And, and it the just racism takes me off. is a great example because it's, it does real harm. I mean, we're not talking about believing in invisible sky gods and stuff. We're, we're talking about how we treat our fellow man. And, mm -hmm. the, and, and the other thing is that because these church leaders have so much authority they have the power to stand up there on the pulpit and declare every single freaking conference to educate people about racism and how much racism is still in this church to, to this day. And to have some some black voices and some other people of color different from different backgrounds to stand up there, to be in leadership positions in in the uh, in the Q15 and in the general authorities to 
or just to even just allow them to speak at general conference, to let them stand up there and say, by the way, here are some ways that members of the church still treat us like crap and educate yeah. people. The, the general authorities have the power to do that. And they don't. They choose not to because, well, they still benefit from racism. So, Absolutely. And, and you saw in the very first press release of the new prophet, you know, I, I, Peggy Fletcher Stack is this brilliant, accomplished journalist. She stands up and she asks that question, what are you going to do to be more inclusive to the voices of minorities and women in the church? And if you, you know, I, I invite you guys to look at the response. It's this rambling, entrenched response that is just so blind to the problems. He doesn't come up with any solutions. At one point, he says, you know, we're a diverse church. You know, most of the leaders in these other countries are, you know, from the local level. So if you go to the South, you're going to find Black leaders. If you go to Africa, you're going to find Black leaders. If you go to Mexico, you'll find Mexican leaders. And like the audacity next is for him to say, those are the real leaders in the church. Like mm -hmm. that they're is such. So. He's the real leader of the church. Right. He's, <laughs> exactly. It's like he thinks we're all idiots. You know, that's yeah. true. It's insulting to our intelligence, knowing that the hierarchy of the priesthood is that he is the prophet. All the Q15 under him, all the 70s exist in a hierarchy of control where they are able to remove, replace and discipline any of those people that they're they are not the real leaders. They may be the real enforcers of what the real leaders do. And so to the members, they, they perceive them as leaders. Say or an influence right. over the church as a whole. And, and there's a, there are black people living in this country. So where are the black church leaders in America? And if we have a white church leader, like a mission leader in another country where people happen to have brown skin, that's okay. But where mm -hmm. are, where are our Brazilian Brazilians in America leading missions in America or leading congregations in America? Almost unheard of. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, <laughs> I was writing an article a few years ago and, um, and the question occurred to my mind, you know, if you're a priesthood holder, you can't get excommunicated by a bishop. It has to be by a stake president. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the question was, well, when was the first time they actually in America called a black stake president? because that would have been the first time that a black man could have excommunicated a white priesthood holder. Mm -hmm. And I did as much searching as I could. And one of the guys who's now a general authority was, uh, when they called him, they said he was the black, first black stake president in America. And it was like 2005. Wow. And so if you wanna see how far the racism extended it was that because, you know, they'll say, well, wait, wait a second. We've had a 70 who was black. Well, you know, the token, the, the one. Right. The, 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 <laughs> the, the token. There's 70, 70s. 70s don't excommunicate. Right. One, and anytime yeah. there's an excommunication, they'll say, well, that's a local ecclesiastical matter because that's mm -hmm. done by stake presidents. And so, you know, a 70 can't go out and excommunicate someone. They can only suggest that someone be excommunicated. It has to actually go through a stake president. Um Anyway, so getting back to the video, you know, we've now, they've set the stage where we have, we, you know, we, we distrust science, we distrust our own logical faculties, our own perceptions, and now that we've instilled some fear and uncertainty about those things, we are now given comforting music, a slow, lilting voice, where he talks about that we can trust God. You know, it's it, it. so one place. Oh, and he says it's God's truth with the way it used to be, the way it is, and the way it always will be. And we've seen this concept that God's truth is unchanging. Well, what about blood atonement? What about Adam God? What about, you know, the temple endowment ceremony that when Joseph Smith first instilled said no one should ever change this? Mm -hmm. And then in 1990, they took out like a huge percent of, of it. Yeah, it's changed um, several times, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so, the, you know, all of these things, it, the church is very changing. And we're seeing it change today, where you go back in time just 20 years, 15, 10 years ago, and you're hearing from the brethren that homosexuality is a choice born of wickedness. It's a perversion. And, you know, God would never create anyone that way, because why would he do that? Mm -hmm. And now we're, we've changed the messaging, thank goodness, so that people are now don't see 
you know, non-binary situations as a perversion, but rather part of the spectrum of being, even if we haven't gotten to the point where people can actually feel whole and accepted in, in that state, we're, we're moving in that direction. And this is, you know, it takes so long because the church has a culture where we, you know, defer our judgment to these men claiming authority. Yeah. And they're not young men either. Uh, they're, no, they're from, no, they're from yeah. a different time. They don't um, understand the issues of today the way that younger people do. I don't want to be ageist or anything. Um, it's more about, it's a, gen, a generation gap. It is uh, being raised differently with different mm-hmm. value, values. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, these are, you know, some of these people, like Monson himself was, you know, an apostle for quite some time while the priesthood ban was still in existence, you know, in his own autobiography, he conveyed racist things. He was in a time of segregation. That's the soil upon which he grew. And those ideas don't leave easily. And And I have uh, no no way to access relating whatsoever to any kind of pro segregationist. I mean, uh, yeah, I, our family was, or, or just growing up in the church was, racist to that level, but the level of racism that, that occurred before I was born, uh, I couldn't relate to that. I have no way of relating to that, but yeah, there are leaders right now who live that and who very much relate to that. So, yeah. yeah. And, and so it, that's, it's almost laughable when you watch the press conference and uh, probably about five minutes of the press conference was each of the brethren talking about how young and capable the 93 year old prophet Nelson was. You know, I think Oaks is like, well, you know, he sprints up the stairs. I can barely keep up with them. And and Iron's like, yeah, he waters, he skis with his family. He still skis. And but has he ever been friends with a gay person? Well, exactly. You know, the thing when I was Mormon, I was friends with gay people uh, in the nineties, and he he hasn't. That's a completely different realm of existence when you have never been friends with a gay person, and I, I doubt he ever has. Yeah, I mean that secluding yourself off and limiting your exposure to the humanity of people that you've labeled as other re-entrenches the alien way that you perceive other people. Yeah. And um, that's what, you know, there's a movie called Oblivion with Tom Cruise that um, I think does such a brilliant job of showing what dehumanizing something that you are separate from is. I'll just drop that out there. If you take a a watch that movie, I loved it for that regard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's. I don't want to spoil it, but it's it's yeah. brilliant in that regard. Okay, l- let's keep going. Uh, all right, let's see what we got here from Air Dieter. Father offers his truth to us, his mortal children. Now, what is this truth? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so Heavenly Father offers his truth to us, his mortal children. What is this truth? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who conveys the gospel of Jesus Christ? The leaders. Well, the leaders do. Yeah. So this is entrenched when you read Doctrine and Covenants section one. It says, whether by my voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people who aren't Mormon who see this video won't understand the threads of manipulation in there. They won't understand that what's actually being conveyed is that we have to listen to these men who poop and fart just like us, but we have to internalize and accept their proclamations above and beyond anything that we might have for ourselves. Mm -hmm. All right. Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. As you accept the responsibility to seek after truth with an open mind and a humble heart, you will become more tolerant of others, more open to listen, more prepared to understand, more inclined to build up instead of tearing down. Okay. So there's some loaded language in that, in that segment, which seems, seemed to be really nice. You know, Mm -hmm. you, the thing that does not make sense with that section is that the whole notion of this video is that we don't know everything so we need to defer our judgment and trust what the brethren say, which historically up until now means that until 1978, you had to think blacks were cursed 
And then that the curse itself, even though the ban was lifted, the curse itself was not disavowed until 2013. Can and I then, add the Book of Mormon still has the bit about how Native Americans were cursed with dark oh, skin? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the, and the Pearl of Great it's, Price. That's still a Mormon belief. Like, as far as I yeah. know, they haven't come out against yeah, that. It's still but in the doctrine. And yeah. then, so, so, you know, these are the ones that are conveying our truth. We have to defer our judgment, accept yeah. what these people say is the gospel. And, and that's going to make us more open-minded and more willing to listen to other people. I, it's I not. Say, it's, yeah, this is the smallest elephant I have ever seen. When I think of this <laughs> elephant parable, you know, I think about, I think about when I read the Tao Te Ching. And I think about uh, when I had a, a Hindu coworker and I asked him about his beliefs. I think about uh, the Buddha statue that I keep on my desk. Um, I, I think about uh, the philosophy books that I've read. I, I think about the vast amount of truth that I have consumed. And it feels like it's this much of the elephant that I'm trying to grasp. They took this elephant that to me is the size of literally the size of the universe. And they made it the LDS gospel. It, it's such a tiny, tiny view of this world, of this universe that we live in. Uh, and to me, that's what's most heartbreaking about this. Um, the leaders are, sh are showing this very small concept of God, of the universe, of the expanses of what truth can be and, and with the human condition, um, the wisdom that so many people have had uh, over, the, over the millennia that human beings have been writing things down. Um, that's what, that's what I find sad about, yeah. about the way he ties and they're, the story. You know, they're, like you said, they're cutting you off at the knees. They're taking away the tools that you would have to even see beyond the limited box that they put you in because they've told you nobody knows anything. Nobody knows everything. You can't trust your own senses. So don't even, don't even worry about that. Just focus on the gospel, focus on what we tell you to do. And it'll all work out in the end. And, and they're still just saying the elephant is a rope. And that's it. That's all they've got. Yeah, is exactly. The yeah. And and, the, and it's the rope you're going to hang yourself with. Because, like, if you're gay, you know, just stay celibate, stay alone until you die. Yeah. And then God will fix you in the afterlife. And and Or if you're so, straight, you've got, that, that's, you've got that, that list of commandments that's incredibly long that oh, yeah. is impossible and the, sh the amount of shame that you have about yourself on a regular basis trying to follow all those commandments and missing the mark is um is unbearable for many people oh and, and they can talk about you know don't don't fall into the trap of toxic perfectionism as we heard uh, elder holland talk about last time you know toxic perfectionism with this whole list of commandments and everybody feels perpetually inadequate because they can't do it. But the brethren can just, anytime you have problems, they can blame it on the fact that, well, you, you know, you haven't been really reading the scriptures every day or having family home evening or whatever. And so, you know, they'll talk against it, but there's another secret recording of elder Holland and elder Uchtdorf that just happened a couple of weeks ago that, that I'll be putting on my channel in a little while. But when they actually go out, and go and visit the wards, you know, at the beginning of the meeting, they say, nobody record this. You're not supposed to record it. Fortunately, we have people that record it, but they say you can be perfect in the little things, be perfect in mm. paying your tithing and go to your meetings and reading your scriptures. And, and, and he says the little things, but then he lists all the things that are so overwhelming that he says, you can be perfect in these things. And then the big things will follow. And so it's double speak. It's just, it's a treadmill that they need you to be on so that you don't pause and look at the wider. You're never gonna see the universe. You're never gonna have time to read all of these other brilliant ideas from men who may have um, you know, come up with new concepts, from women who may have expanded horizons of ways to see yourself and the world around you. You're never gonna have a chance to explore those things because you're focused on the brethren. And any time that you're not you know, reading the ends in or anything like that is wasted time. Yeah. But you know that's it. That's the that's the limited elephant view. I I love how you tied that in. All right, so let's let's keep a look and see what we you go. will be more willing to go where God wants you to go. It is my prayer that you will seek the truth earnestly. And okay, I got to stop it. You're gonna be more willing. So he just says you're gonna be more willing to you know listen to other people's perspectives to 
you know, be open and understanding and more willing to go where God wants you to go. Mm -hmm. And remember, we're talking not about where God wants you to go. We're, you have to rephrase it. Willing to go where the men claiming to speak for God tell you to go. Right. That's what it really is. And so it, it, it just, it traps you in the box that Elder Nelson, Elder Holland and Elder Bednar are laying out. And the fact that it's done distorting what should be liberating ideas about humility of knowledge, uh, it sickens me. And that's kind of why I get worked up about this thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. That you will yearn to drink from the fount of all truth, whose waters are pure and sweet, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, pure water, sweet water, spring up into a well of everlasting life. So, you know, he did end with that phobia induction where you, you put out one of the things that really speaks to all mankind, you know, our fear of, um, of, of losing our life, our fear of death. And so he's held out this carrot, eternal life, but you have to go to the well water. Well, who's filling that well with water? Well, it's the brethren who tell us how to see ourselves, how to see the world, what we have to do with our time, the choices we have to make. And, you know, so you can say it in pious terms. You can have smiles and all the characters. But what we're really talking about is control, submitting your personal choices, your identity to the church, to the edicts of the brethren. And, and even the goal that he's establishing is a small elephant in the sense that it's everlasting life. And the, and the goal of, of the LDS church is atonement and salvation and other, other religions, other uh, philosophies, other ways of looking at the world have other points of view on what the goal might be. Um, maybe it's contentment, maybe it's inner peace. Maybe, I mean, there are a lot of valid spiritual goals or, psychological goals that we can have as human beings, not just everlasting life. And, uh, uh, but yeah, you, th he does pull out dispensing of existence there. He d there is that sort of implied death threat of what's the opposite of everlasting life. Well, everlasting death or yeah. short-term death. I'm not sure which of you make both words opposite, <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah. I, I really like what you just brought up in terms of, um, you know, if you're only in the church, you only see the purpose of life as getting to that, that salvation criteria. And so the, the attendant part of that, that you'll hear referenced again and again in general conference is sacrifice. You've got to sacrifice in order to fulfill these requirements. And that involves not looking after yourself. Um, it involves making other people's priorities supersede your own. Um, especially that of the brethren. And if you have depression or anxiety, if you have those problems, since the goal is this salvation, you've got to put all that on the back burner and, and pursue what is required for this salvation. Whereas if you just take away that, that imperative and look at, the, at your life, at what it means to be, to have a good life, through some other lenses, which may include other spiritual lenses that you talked about, or things such as mental well-being and mental health, contentment, then, then you allow yourself, you know, suddenly that pressure to fit those criterias because of the fear of the jeopardization of your soul goes away and it allows you to approach your life in the here and now in a way that can be healthier, that can be more fulfilling that is not characterized by always having to surrender or give up your own priorities. Mm -hmm. And it's, it feels wrong to do that when you come out of Mormonism because Mormonism loads that imperative to, to sacrifice with shame and guilt. So suddenly if you're, you know, looking for your own needs, your own um, interests, your own health, your own well being, then that it feels guilty to do that. Mm -hmm. It feels shameful. Yeah, because we were indoctrinated yeah. to, to feel that way. But that's the thing is those criteria can be counterproductive towards other potential spiritual or psychological goals. Mm. Um, those criteria, if, if you're looking for inner peace or a sense of well-being, 
having a constant list of things that you're not doing well enough is going to wreck any sense of uh, of contemplation or satisfaction or um, just stability that you'll that you'll have or self esteem even. Um, so yeah, having when you're when you're not constantly hearing what the brethren have in mind for us as the end goal of what the whole point of life is, when we are allowed to set our own goals for what the point of life is, um, then we have different ways of getting getting to those goals. So mm -hmm. we can make those choices for ourselves, which is the point of supposedly the point of free agency, right? Yeah. The um, I think that's been one of the things that has been most healing for me is is just giving myself. Um, you know, a different way to look at my own existence and, and find good things where I find them and internalize them and trust my own judgment, my own voice, and not always feel like I'm in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, there's a certain anxiety that is always there when you're in that frame of mind where you feel like you're not good enough, you're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to be free of that is very liberating. And it, and it goes a very long way towards healing in your mental health area. Yep. Okay, so uh, we reached the end of the video, I think. Let me, let me see if we get this music at the end. Mm -hmm. The end. <laughs>